The Chucky TV show just wrapped up its first season, so I figured it was a good time to look back on the series as a whole and talk about some of the unanswered questions that it raised. Uh, one of the best parts about the Child's Play films is that they've been written for, for the most part by one guy, Don Mancini, and because of that, there's a consistency that most other franchises don't have. Oh, oh, but there's still questions. Um, Lots of them. And in order to answer them, I'm, I'm going to have to watch all the movies again. And, and you know, I watch a lot of movies for this channel, so I have to spend a lot of time at my desk staring at a computer screen. And that's a little rough on the eyes. Uh, so the guys over at Ben Q were nice enough to fix me up with their monitor screen bar, which I, which I happen to love. It easily popped right up on top of my computer and lights up my desk area, illuminating exactly how much unnecessary crap I have on it and how much in need of cleaning it off that I am. There's adjustable color temperature for when I want to set the proper mood, like if I'm doing a run of Ferguson films, I set that sucker for a soothing cool tone, like, like the most soothing, coolest, relaxing his tone that I possibly can. It's streamlined, I just plug that sucker right into a USB port and it blocks out all that glare, but unfortunately does not have a setting to block out human centipede sequels, but who knows, um, maybe in a, maybe in a future model. Hidey ho! <laughs> Why would John even have a voodoo doll of himself? In the original film, Chucky learned voodoo from a guy named John, or Dr. Death, who I guess wasn't really aware of Charles's true nature when he did so, because when he comes across him again, he accuses him of perverting everything he was taught. So he's not really looking to help him get out of his dull form, so Chuck resorts to darker measures. You see, it seems that John has a voodoo doll of himself, and I guess that Chucky knew where to find it. He even says that John told him where to find it, so let's consider how ill-conceived that this was for Dr. Death here. He has a voodoo doll of himself that can be used against him and then teaches dark magic to, I, I guess, just anybody without doing any sort of background check, and then just blabs where he keeps said doll. How on earth does he think that this won't come back to bite him in the ass, or snap him in the leg, or whatever you want to call it? It's a terrible idea, and Chucky even calls him out on it, but just, um, why? In terms of the why he has it, there's a couple of reasons. One is that he uses it for positive spells, like if it can be used to inflict pain, who's to say it can't be used for pleasure as well? John's lifestyle seems a little seedy, so who, who knows what, he, what he's into. And who says that he even made it? Maybe a rival did, or an ex-lover, and John was able to get his hands on it. I imagine that you can't really just uh, destroy a voodoo doll, uh, lest you be destroyed, so he'd have to hold on to it and keep it somewhere safe. But then why uh, tell Chucky? The reasons for this are less sound, but again, I point to the lifestyle and the fact that he shows some poor judgment in picking Lee Ray to have as an apprentice in the first place. It can be inferred that John is in the middle of a bad time and keeps some unseemly company. I can kind of see him using it as, a, as part of a drunken brag, like, like, hey, my ex made a voodoo doll of me, but I got the upper hand on her. Ha ha ha. Aren't I awesome? D don't use it to break my bones, uh, please. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Whatever happened to Mike Norris? Mike Norris, the man who killed Chucky, or at least his human form. He was the police detective that tracked down Charles Lee Ray and shot him, forcing the killer to transfer his soul into the famous doll. He's a secondary protagonist of the first film and then is never seen again. We do hear about him though since they discuss him in the second film. Apparently, when questioned about his version of the events, he and his partner didn't exactly tell the truth. The guy from the toy company says that the police officers played it smart and kept quiet, which was uh, pretty bad news for Karen Barkley, Andy's mom, since she ends up being the sole person to agree with her son about the serial killer possessing the body of his doll and trying to attack them. This of course lands her under psychiatric care and she loses custody of Andy, placing him into foster care, where he'll stay for a minimum of another eight years. At the start of the second movie, it's been about two years or so, and he's separated. In the third movie, he's still bouncing around and ending up in a military academy. So even if she's no longer locked away, she's still not reunited with her kid. This seems like kind of a dick move by Mike. I mean, the execs say that they were playing it smart, but 
there were multiple witnesses to the thing moving around. Wouldn't them backing her story to some degree at least keep her from being locked away? Even if they didn't agree with the voodoo possession part and agreed that the doll was moving on its own and attacking them, it seems like it would paint her story in a more favorable light. Let's face it, those cops screwed her. I guess it could be said that their jobs were threatened, like the chief of police said he'd fire them if they agreed with her, which again, still kind of dick. Staying on the force meant more than this innocent woman losing control of her only child and being institutionalized for what turned out to be years. Uh, it would have been hard to disagree with three separate adults, two of which were prominent police detectives, all just saying, hey, we all saw the dog move around, uh, so clearly there was some foul play here. Keeping quiet just made her look like the crazy one, and she was treated as such. So yeah, in terms of character motivations, it was like Mike Norris was channeling a little bit of Humperdinck right here. That one little mention in part two is just about the only time that he's mentioned in the entire rest of the series, until Curse of Chucky, when we meet Andy again for the first time since part three. He's on the phone with his mother, and he asks her how Mike is, and asks her to say hi for him. It's not exactly stated outright that this is Norris, but it's certainly implied. And there seems to be an insinuation that they're together in some way based on the way that he says it. So it would seem that somewhere along the way, the two had some sort of reconciliation. Perhaps after seeing what happened to her as a result of him keeping quiet, he had a change of heart and fought to have her released. Regardless of it, they're together or, or just keep in touch. It's, it certainly seems like he's part of the Barkley family's life in some way. So it seems like there's no ill will, even if Karen's situation was basically his fault. It should be noted that he appears in a Child's Play comic book series in which the decision is made clear that he would lose his job and reputation if he told the truth about the matter. He then tries to get Karen released, but is ultimately killed by Chucky. So clearly this comic is not in canon, so these events aren't factored into the actual continuity. One thing though, Mike is the guy that killed Chucky. Twice. And one of them was his human form, so it seems like there should be some sort of grudge there, but yet he's never tried to go back after him for revenge. I suppose it could be considered that he was thankful to Mike in a way, releasing him from his body and allowing him his new life as Chucky, the killer doll, a, a destiny he seems to relish after a while, but maybe, just maybe, Chucky's scared of him. Perhaps the guy who killed him is a bit more of a boogeyman than he'd like to admit and is a bit nervous about a rematch. Or, you know, it's Chris freaking Sarandon. Maybe he's just reluctant to murder a guy who's that freaking handsome. Hey, wanna play? Does Andy's mom really just have a, a pair of pants in that giant box? It's the kid's birthday. Karen gives Andy his present and it's a pair of pants? Seriously, that's the only thing that she pulls out of this crate. It's like today's Amazon where you get this package that's the size of your porch and you open it up and it's this vibrating foot massager that I ordered. Or I mean, um, you ordered. Now, th this might seem trivial, but I wanna investigate this. Uh, look at this kid. He's dressed in a good guy doll outfit. He's watching good guy cartoons. All this little dude talks about is good guy stuff. And here's this box, which just so happens to be the exact same size as the container that, guess what? Yup, good guy dolls come in. Look, there's another present that's good guy related and the wrapping is the same exact size as the package. So it's not like mom has no clue on how to wrap things properly. How did she think he was going to feel? What on earth did she think he would expect out of this good guy doll sized box? Is she purposefully dicking him around? You would think that because there's no way that she would be able to not foresee his disappointment here. But I like to think a little more of Karen here, name notwithstanding. I don't think that she would intentionally taunt her son like this. No, the, the movie actually emphasizes the point that she's not in the best place financially, which says something about the 80s since she's treated as like lower middle class and yet has this awesome place that she can afford on a single retail salary. But she's not too well off and stresses her money problems quite a bit. 
the most likely scenario is that she just doesn't have a ton of time and money to go out and grab proper wrapping tools like boxes that fit, and she works at a store, and I can tell you from experience that there's always plenty of boxes there, and she probably just had to grab what was available and take home to use as the box for this um, a pair of jeans, and is so burnt from her hectic working schedule that she just didn't put two and two together. Why does Chucky appear to be giving his body orders? This is such a weird moment that I'm surprised that more people don't talk about it, but near the ending of the first Child's Play movie, there's a moment in which, after Chucky has been burned up and decapitated, he's still attacked, coming after Mike's partner, Jack. So, his body and head are two separate pieces, and while his body is strangling Jack, the head is on a desk, and it starts shouting out, <laughs> It sounds like he's giving his body orders, even saying don't let go at one point. Is his body now a distinct entity capable of its own actions? Is this an early indicator of Chucky's ability to split his soul as we see later on in the series? Um, nothing about it makes any sense, but that's probably the point. Chucky's at a huge disadvantage here. He's burnt up like that one time I tried to make chocolate chip cookies and torn to a bunch of pieces and up against a group, several of them armed. He knows that he's down to his last, simply lashing out in a last ditch effort. So he wants them disoriented. Shouting like that was a confusion tactic meant to throw them off. Were they up against one opponent or two? And Chucky knows that the way to kill him at this point is to shoot him in the heart. So why not be as loud and as confusing as possible to draw their fire? And come on, I mean, who, who doesn't do this from time to time? Come on, do it. Edit the episode. Edit the episode. Edit. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? Why wouldn't the police believe Andy's mom? Wasn't the body a mass of human organs? Quite a big deal was made over the course of the first movie, and in fact, most of the later movies, about the fact that Chucky's body becomes more and more human the longer that he stays in it. He's got blood and guts and, as we see in part 3, muscle and tissue beneath the skin. Seed of Chucky even shows that Tiffany has a full set of internal organs happening. So, at the beginning of the second movie, it's shown that no one believes the Barclays about their story and the idea of the killer doll is ignored. But don't they have proof? I mean, isn't Chucky a mass of internal organs underneath? I mean, seriously, look at the wall. There's blood all over. Who, whose blood do they think that that is? Can't they do a DNA test on it? Would it even match Charles Lee Ray? The, the opening of part two makes it a bit confusing as they restore the body of the doll, but they only ever show the head. Although it seems to have human parts underneath. They, they don't really show underneath the skull part to reveal what's under there, but it seems like some is still human. In the third, we don't really see much of the body, but it does seem to have blood in it still, showing that there's still some humanity in the corpse. But then, it's inconsistent, since Bride of Chucky begins with Tiffany stitching up Chucky's corpse and sewing the pieces back together, and it seems like it's simply doll parts once again. So it would seem... As if when the soul is defeated inside the doll, it indeed reverts back to a doll-like state and can revert back when re-inhabited. It can be assumed that the Tiffany doll has normal doll parts inside and only becomes human innards when Glenn uses the spell on them, which is why the FX artist is shocked. If it had always had organs, I don't think he'd be as taken aback by this moment. Knowing this, I guess it can be assumed that the parts of the doll that look human in the beginning of part two aren't. Those are just what the good guy doll teeth and mouth look like. It's kind of horrifying. This just leaves the opening of part three. If the doll reverts back to human when Chucky is killed, why does this one still have blood to leak into the plastic? Well, how about this one? He's not really dead. As we know from the first movie, the only way to kill Chucky is to destroy his heart. In part two, in the finale, his heart is still intact. He's lost his head and lower half, but the heart is still there. So, without the brain and such, it's assumed that he doesn't exactly have consciousness, so it's not like he's awake and aware and frozen there for eight freaking years, but the body is still cursed. It's still active, so it's still flesh and blood underneath. 
At the ending of the first one, the heart was destroyed, so the curse was broken, reverting to a plastic construct. So, when the police arrived, there would be no evidence of human tissue for them to find in the doll's body. I mean, they'd still have to explain why exactly that doll would have multiple bullets in it if it, if it were just a normal piece of rubber, or I don't know. Maybe they just said that they confused the good guy for a weapon and, and felt threatened, so they felt six shots were necessary. <laughs> why doesn't the blood in the plastic affect more than one doll? Wouldn't all the dolls made from it be haunted? So that aforementioned blood spills into a vat of plastic at the factory as they decide to kick it back into gear and put good guys back into production. And, and let's face it, this whole scenario is one giant question. Is this eight years later like the rest of the movie? Why, why did no one clean any of this up? Wouldn't this be evidence? Why, why is there still just this big vat of plastic there? And how is it still liquid? Is it all turned on? Why would they start production before cleaning this place out? Anyway, some of the Chucky's blood spills out into the plastic and it mixes together. And it's through this blood that he's able to inhabit yet another doll body. But why only one? This blood goes into the whole vat. I, I find it a little hard to believe that entire thing only produced one doll. And I find it even harder to believe that if they used that vat to make more than one, that all of the blooded plastic would make into the same one. So if this big bunch of environmentally friendly goop made a bunch of dolls and some blood is in each one of them, why aren't there multiple possessed Chuckies running around? We know it's possible from the later movies, and Don Mancini's original intent was to introduce the concept here, but it's still just a single Chuckster. Well, the answer here comes down to the soul. The spell that was used was very specific, and was used to place his soul into another vessel. The later films clarify that splitting his soul requires an entirely different spell. The Ade Due Dambala chant is a one per customer deal. It can't separate the soul, and that spell is specifically about the soul and not the blood. Yes, the blood serves as the catalyst here, but it's not the driving force behind the return. If multiple dolls were manufactured from this vat, the most likely scenario is that Chucky's soul entered the first one off the line that contained the blood. After that point, and the soul now has occupied a vessel, the blood truly doesn't matter anymore. So there's just a bunch of dolls uh, with serial killer blood in them, which I imagine ups their collectability. It, it's kind of like that old Kiss comic, but with less chess hair and sexual harassment lawsuits. I like to be hugged. I like to be hugged. Why do some things hurt Chucky, but others don't? This is the one that always drives me bananas and I'm surprised that more people don't talk about it, but how much that Chucky can actually feel makes very little sense. Uh, let's review. First movie, uh, Chuck gets burned. He feels it enough to stop his assault and yell out in pain. A little while later, he's shot in the leg and yells out in pain. So it's clear that as he becomes more and more human, he feels the pain that he's inflicted. Now. In the second film, when Richard Fish is transporting the new good guy, he straight up slams the trunk on his face multiple times and Chucky doesn't react at all. So maybe it's because he's newly reborn, still mostly at all. I mean, later on in the film, he's shown getting a nosebleed, so perhaps at this point, he'll start to feel the pain. But then, Kitty Farmer just manhandles him and throws him around, and it doesn't affect him. So. Perhaps the transformation isn't complete yet, but then, like a little while later, Andy cuts him and he screams out in pain. But then, just a little bit later, he's roughly jammed to a trash can without feeling it. This pretty much continues throughout the series, like in part 3 he gets carried around by his arm, which, which can't feel good, carried by his hair, which I guarantee would hurt, and slammed into a trash truck, none of which he feels. Shortly after, a shoe is thrown at him and it hurts him, but right after, as Andy is smacking him on the floor, the hits don't register. It's in Bride too, like Tiffany tickles him and he feels the tickles. And then as Doll Tiffany smacks him, which he feels, but then later they get banged around again, like Tiffany is just smacked off this table. And, and, and you get the picture. Depending upon whether Chucky is being stealthy or in attack mode, he either feels pain or doesn't. And it doesn't really seem to matter how far into the process that he is. So how does he do it? My guess is that he can sort of deactivate his soul. 
in Cult of Chucky, when he takes over Nika's body, he says that she's taking a nap. So that raises the question of a soul in a body being what amounts to being repressed. Who's to say that it can't be possible for him to do this as well? Can he, quote, take a nap while in the doll and he needs to hide and stay still? I think so, and doing so makes it so that you can just toss that thing around with him not even flinching, because let's face it, if you stood really still and pretended to be like a doll, it's not like you can just keep your body rigid enough to seem plastic while someone carries you around. I, I think that it gets harder for him to do the longer he stays in the body, which is why he never tries it while in peril for his life at the end of the flicks, which is kind of fine, because by that point, he doesn't really need to stay hidden anyway. But now I'm curious. All right, are you ready? Be a doll. Stay perfectly still, just like a doll. Don't move. Be a doll. Freeze. Freeze. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I wouldn't talk if I were you. Why doesn't Chucky mention the heart of Dumbala before Bride? Here's a tough one because it's been discussed before and even Don Mancini has discussed his rationale for it, but we're gonna try to come up with some sort of BS to make it make sense. The first three movies established that Chucky can only swap his soul into the first person he tells his secret to. In the first two movies, that's Andy, and in the third, it's little Tyler. Mancini had expressed an interest in moving away from that same storyline with Chucky having to put his soul into a child adversary. So, in Bride of Chucky, he introduced the heart of Dumbala. Using it, it's possible for him to swap his soul out into anybody that he chooses. Coincidentally, he was wearing it when he died, so the heart is still with his body, and all they have to do is travel to go get it. But if this was always a possibility, then why didn't he use it earlier? Why go through all the trouble of trying to put his souls into Andy and Tyler? Doesn't that negate the entire series? I mean, well, couldn't you just say that it's due the time limit? John says that he has a limited time to put his soul into Andy before the doll body turned human and he would be trapped forever. So couldn't it be possible that he just assumed he wouldn't have the means or time to get to his body before becoming stuck? Well, during Bride, he doesn't even seem concerned about that time limit aspect, so apparently the heart can operate around that as well, which kind of eliminates that whole possibility. But I think there's an easy explanation for it, actually. When Tiffany restores him, he mentions wanting to get out of the doll body once and for all, but he's quickly locked up. Now, here's the important part. He's left in that playpen overnight, and he's in there for at least until the middle of the next day. He's in the sort of living room of this trailer to one side of him is the bathroom and to the other side is the bedroom. And when Tiffany restores Chucky to life by using the Voodoo for Dummies book, she's in the living room. That book is in the living room. We don't see it again until later on, but he could possibly have gotten his hands on it and, and read it. Even if he didn't do it then, there's clearly a time gap in between him restoring Tiffany and them both having the book together. It's pretty probable that while reading the book, he got to the passage about the heart of Dumbala and realized it was the answer to his problems. He probably had the heart when he was alive, possibly stolen, but had no clue what it was for. Then he read the book, seized the passage, and finally understood that he had this thing of great value and power. It's pretty clear that he had freshly read the book since he's able to rattle off the page and chapter number to her, even though, whoops, uh, I mean, he says uh, chapter six, page 217, and it's apparently chapter 11, page 217, so he hasn't memorized it that well. So the heart was always in play and always an option for Chucky to use, but he wasn't just ignoring it to go after Andy. He actually didn't know what it did until he read that book. All right, see, that question is not that hard, but wait a second. This Heart of Dumbala has a large entry in a mass market book about voodoo, one that you'd have to figure that quite a few people read, and, and it's the same amulet that is pictured around the neck of a much publicized killer's neck, and no one put two and two together and were like, Let, let's go get that necklace? Uh, and, also, and also, what happened to that thing? It's front and center in two movies, and then there's two more movies in a TV show that don't even mention it. I guess I'll cover that in volume two. Heidi ho <laughs> Why doesn't Chucky have blood in him in Curse? In all the earlier Child's Play movies, it's established that as he stays inside the doll's body, it becomes more and more human. Because of this, when he's injured, he bleeds. 
Injuries take more and more of a toll on him, and wounds get bloodier and bloodier. But when we get to Cult of Chucky near the end of the movie, he gets his head knocked off. And then later, he's stabbed with a large knife. On both of these occasions, instead of blood or gore, there's just doll parts and stuffing that come out. Doesn't this contradict everything that we've seen before? Yes. And no. There's a couple of things that come into play here, and all of it stems from one little word. Voodoo. Oh uh, yeah, you forgot there's some magic stuff here, right? It's not some AI realism stuff. We've got magic involved, so we have an explanation. You have to keep in mind that there's a nine year gap between Seed and Curse. That, that's close to a decade that, they, that we don't know what he was up to. We know that in 2009, he's still estranged from Tiffany and the human forms of Glenn and Glenda and that his arm is still separated, but that's all. Even that epilogue is four years away from him resurfacing in Curse. That's tons of time for him to figure some stuff out. And, and considering we know that he's at least partially alive in 09, he's awake and active. And now, he's no longer distracted by a quest to get out of that doll body. He has the heart of Dumbala and has awareness of more voodoo information. With that, it's pretty easy to see that since he accepted being a doll, he found a spell that would ensure that he would either retain doll insides or would be able to have control over it. I do think it's funny that this bit of continuity really upsets people online the most because it's, it's inconsistent, but I mean, y you kill him if you shoot his heart, but then he's back through electricity, and then he's back because of blood and plastic, but then there's an amulet that controls switching, and then special effects artists made his doll into a prop for a movie, and, and this, seriously? Is the sticking point? Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Does Curse of Chucky retcon the first film? We don't know a lot about the night that Charles Lee Ray died. In the first film, we see him being chased by Detective Norris, and he's with his accomplice, Eddie. He shot and killed, and the news tells us that he was a serial killer and was found out, and they were chasing him after a robbery, and that's pretty much all that we know. Later, in Bride of Chucky, we're told by Tiffany that they were together the night that he died. She says that he left a ring on the mantle as he left, and she assumed that that meant that he wanted to marry her. And then later, in Curse of Chucky, we're shown flashbacks to that night, and see that Tiffany is nowhere to be seen, and that Charles instead kidnapped Nika's mother, and was holding her captive right before the cops showed up to chase him down. Doesn't that retcon the earlier events? Does, does that mean that he wasn't with Tiffany? Or Eddie even? Not really, it, it's just that we were never given the full details. It, it's likely that he was with Tiffany at her place and then left, placing the ring on the mantle, or just forgetting it there, as we'll later find out. He then leaves her place, is picked up by Eddie, and taken to Nika's parents' place to carry out his next crime. He kills her dad and takes the mom hostage, and Eddie might not even have known the circumstances of why they were going there, believing that they were just robbing the family and unaware of Charles's weird obsession. And either way, Eddie was likely waiting outside as the getaway and the police rolled up, causing them to leg it and leading directly into the opening of part one. It's likely the media and police wouldn't be fully aware of the infatuation part of the story, so it was reported as a robbery, a, a home invasion. So yeah, very easily, all of those things are possible. I, I'm not sure why that one's confusing, but there's always a bunch of chatter about it online. But I don't, I don't know, isn't that what online is anyway? Just, just a bunch of chatter? How does Chunky make Nika walk again? This one really got to me for a while because it doesn't really make much sense, but then again, I, I guess it I guess it does. I mean, so Nika is in a wheelchair. She is unable to walk or even feel her legs, and yet after her body is taken over by Chucky, she can. She just walks around with ease like nothing's wrong. But how would a soul transfer also heal her legs? On a strictly physical level, it shouldn't work, but this is voodoo magic we're talking about. I guess the side benefit of the spell is that it gives you control of the vessel you're in as well. If it didn't, and the transfer was limited to strictly ethereal stuff, like soul only, then when Charles transferred into the good guy doll, he'd just be stuck. But he's not. He can make the doll move around. He makes an inanimate object move. The same logic. Haha, <laughs> I said logic, applies to Nika's legs. 
they aren't working per se, they are just being animated like a puppet or a doll. The implications of this are insanely far-reaching. What other maladies could be fixed simply by transferring bodies? Think of the benefits for paraplegics or people with that locked-in syndrome. In case you weren't looking to sleep at night, locked-in syndrome is when you're completely aware but are totally unable to move except for your eyes, otherwise known as my absolute total worst nightmare. If you had knowledge of this effect of the spell, couldn't it be used to essentially fix those people? If so, I need to find out if it's possible to do in real life, just on the odd chance that I become affected by locked-in syndrome, also known as the thing I never, ever, ever want to happen to me, um, ever. Hi, I like to be hugged. So wait a minute, um, why don't more people switch their bodies in this universe? Seriously, think about it. Tiffany learned how to bring Chucky back to life using that book, and Chucky learns how to split his soul into multiple bodies with the Voodoo for Dummies website. So these things are pretty commonplace out there. It, it would have been a little more limited knowing that originally, it seemed like the heart was needed to complete these spells, but Chucky's just putting his soul into things left and right with just a simple chant and no accessories. And I mean, come on, Char Charles Lee Ray isn't like some master adept at the dark arts, so you kinda have to assume that completing these spells is at least somewhat easy, so why don't more people do it? Why isn't this a universe in which people are swapping souls and making multiples of themselves left and right? This is a mass market book, and those dummy books sell big. I did some looking, and even some of the less mainstream titles sell big. I found sales data for 2012, and a book like Stock Investing for Dummies was selling over 100 copies per week. Even having that would allot a few thousand readers a year for Voodoo's for Dummies. And you could guarantee that a large chunk of those would actually attempt the spells. And if they're as easy as it looks in the movies, you'd have to assume that some would be successful. Well, maybe it's because you still have to have the heart of Dumbala, just not on you. I mean, Chucky's split up his soul quite a bit, so who knows which is the actual original model? Perhaps one part of your soul has to have possession of it, which then spreads to the others by way of magic. Maybe this is why it worked for Charles in the first movie. He was wearing the amulet. When he tried to swap with Andy, perhaps the spell still worked because he technically was still wearing it, except it was just his corpse. That only leaves the bit with Tiffany using the book to revive Chucky, which could easily just be attributed to the spell only working to jumpstart the magic that was already in him. And there's not much aftermarket use for a spell which will reanimate something that had already been animated by using the heart of Dambala. It's also possible that her chant had little to do with it and it was just the stitching together that revived him. I mean, after all, we saw in the second and third movie that when he was put back together, he was just able to come back, uh, no chant required. So it's possible that the book isn't as effective as it appears. But just to make sure, I've ordered the book from an independent bookseller because screw Amazon and I'm gonna test it out so if you see me hosting next week's video from um this guy then the spell worked he's not looking he's in rough shape I am Chucky the killer dog is Chucky in the same universe as the other killers Probably the most discussed element of Bride of Chucky is the opening scene in which we see an evidence locker with several very familiar looking objects. There's what appears to be Jason's hockey mask, Freddy's glove, Leatherface's chainsaw, and Michael Myers' mask. Because of this, there's a gaggle. What's the definition of a gaggle? Is that a quantifiable number? I know that it's like a bunch of geese, but I've seen like a group of three Geese, does that qualify? At what point are you like, hey, look, a couple of geese, and someone's like, no, that's over the limit. It's now a gaggle. Um, anyway, there's a whole bunch of fan theories saying that this locker places all of the characters within the same universe, and it's a big shared continuity, with some going even further to link it into an even bigger universe, including about a dozen other horror movies. But does that work? Is this evidence locker evidence that the characters exist alongside Chucky? Well, not to me. 
Besides the fact that this was just intended as an inside joke, come on, look at this mask. Can you really see Jason wearing this cheap looking knockoff? This belongs more on a character from Bloody Murder or Unmasked Part 25. Jason wouldn't be caught dead in this. And, and oh yeah, this movie takes place in 1998. And according to my timeline, that's around the time of Friday 8 or 9. And Jason's masks were either cracked in half by a psychic girl or melted onto his face by New York sewer toxic waste at this point, or possibly dragged down into hell by Freddy himself. It surely wouldn't have been in an evidence locker. Meanwhile, there's Freddy's glove in 1998. He's rocking out in Springwood just before the events of Freddy's dead. He, he's powered up at that point. Why would his glove be at the police? And as for the chainsaw, why would anyone think that this belongs to Leatherface? It, it's a chainsaw, uh, just a chainsaw. It's not like there's only one. Plus, this is in Lockport, which is assumed to be Lockport, New York. But I guess it doesn't have to be. Uh, I assume Chucky's body would be held near Kent Military School, but they never really say where that's located, but I'm pretty damn sure that it's not in Texas. That just leaves Michael's mask, and if this is 98, then, I mean, who, who knows what continuity we're in. If it's the original, then Michael's been dead for a few years, or I, mean, I, I don't know what happened to him at the ending of Part 6, or it's H2O continuity, and this is the mask from right after Laurie chopped his head off, but that was set in California. What would it be doing in an evidence locker on the other side of the country? And if it's the original continuity mask, why would it still be in an evidence locker? S several states away. No. Clearly, this isn't even Michael's mask, but the severed head of William Shatner after a tragic kabuki performance. I, I, I don't know, if you really wanted to stretch it, I could maybe give you the mask being actually evidence and that could link Chucky to Michael even though it makes no sense at all and if we're talking about sense in a killer possessed voodoo doll movie, so if, so if you wanted to, I guess fine. And the Freddy glove again makes no sense, but if you wanted to devise a complex series of events for it to be here, sure, whatevs, but that ain't no Leatherface saw. That's, that's just a saw. And, and that, that sure ain't no Jason mask, but if you really wanted the Freddy's glove to be real, I guess that pulls in Jason anyway. But the fact remains, there's no reason for them to have these in an evidence locker in a police station, nowhere near where these killers are based, and no reason for them to just coincidentally have them in the same one. And hey, if the presence of a Michael Myers mask or a Freddy glove convinces you that this film has to be in the same universe as Chucky, should I remind you that um, our universe has those things too? Uh, really? You, you can buy a Michael Myers mask pretty much anywhere. And a Freddy glove. An, an actual bladed one isn't too hard to find either. Here you go. I just found one on eBay. It's real. Does that make us in Chucky's universe? Well, uh, again... I go back to the experiment. Let's find out. Let's do this. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to transfer uh, my soul into this doll and see if it works, I, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed these questions. Uh, if, if you like these answers, please let me know. If you have other questions about the Child's Play series, just put them down below in there. Leave me a good comment. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Um, do all that stuff. Check out my patrons over here on patreon.com and uh, slash movie timelines. And you can help support this channel. I would, certainly would appreciate that. It would help me buy a new gizmo doll because look how destroyed this thing is. Um, but I'm going to try and put my soul into it right now. Let's see if this works. Are do a dambala. Give me the power I beg of you. Well, um, damn, uh, okay, see you shortly for another great video, I, I guess.